Hello and welcome to Info Under the Radar. I'm your host Vishwajit. I'm Devendra. Welcome to season two of our uh, podcast. Um, we know it's been a while since we have came to your ears. Um, also longer than we promised at the end of season one. Uh, but now we are back and we are very excited for what we have stored in the season two. Uh, we have a promo on our channel where you can find more information about what we are planning to do in season two, very different topics than season one, uh, different guests as well. We are very excited to share uh, with you all of those things. But more importantly, today we are talking about a very exciting topic, uh, at least for us, which is CRISPR. And we are talking to none other than Kevin Davies. Uh, Kevin is a well-known voice in the CRISPR community. Um, he currently holds the executive editor position at the CRISPR Journal. He's originally from UK. Um, he's currently living in uh, Washington, DC. Um, he did his master's in University of Oxford, did his PhD from University of London in molecular genetics. Uh, back in the days, he was also founding editor of Nature's Genetics Journal. Um, and on top of all this, he is a prolific author with multiple books on topics such as uh, cracking the genome uh, inside the race to unlock the human DNA, the $1,000 genome, uh, or the thousand dollar genome, DNA, the story of genetic revolution, and his latest one, Editing Humanity, the CRISPR revolution and the new era of genome editing. This is um, one of the books which also led us to talking to uh, Kevin on this topic. Uh, before we jump in to our conversation with Kevin, maybe Dave, you want to give us a brief mm -hmm. introduction of a what exactly time. CRISPR is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, like it, me being no expert is a disclaimer I should put up front, but it was just a technology that I got interested in a couple of years back. And now we are fortunate enough to talk with Kevin. CRISPR, essentially the abbreviation, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. Well, it, it sounds like I, start, I, I would <laughs> jump into a rap right after that, but... <laughs> It's it's what this is. And this is the last okay. time we're going to mention it during our conversation, the entire full form of that. Um, many of you, including myself, would have uh, heard of CRISPR as the gen genomic scissors or the genetic scissors that could be used to alter humanity. And that's essentially it is. But what exactly that is it? As simple as that, it's a technology that, it, that could be used to edit genomes and fundamentally has the potential to alter this, the, the path of humanity going forward. If I go towards little towards a little slightly more descriptive definition of it as per what new scientists uh, describes it as, is that it's a way of finding a specific bit of DNA inside a cell. DNA being mm -hmm. the fundamental thing that contains all the information that we need. And after that, the next step is CRISPR edits it out to the finest of that nanoscale and then we can see the, uh, the, the results of that being we being resilient to some sort of diseases or we develop some sort of required features in humans and so on and so forth. So that's essentially CRISPR. It's essentially, uh, it's basically something that could be used to edit out the very finest bit of information that is required and that makes up what humans actually are. So yeah, mm -hmm. that as for me is CRISPR. So how how did you come to know about this topic, Vishwajit? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, to be honest, like I did not knew like the depths of this topic as much, um, as much as I know now due to preparation of this episode. And then of course, having a nice conversation with Kevin. I think I got to know about it because of this uh, infamous incident in China where um, one of the Chinese scientists tried to edit uh, genome of uh, unborn children uh, embryos basically and they are still out there Lulu mm -hmm. and Nana yeah. and we actually went into details um, about it with Kevin because Kevin was right there when all of this was happening mm -hmm. I think this is also a good segment for mm -hmm. us to then take you to our nice conversation yeah. with Kevin welcome Kevin S thank you so much first of all 
for taking out time for us early in the morning there. Uh, it's just so nice to see you. And um, how's it been? How's it going for you so far? Great. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Look forward to uh, talking about all things CRISPR. <laughs> yeah, all the crunchier bits of it as well. For sure, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, before, we, before we dive in into this, uh, while we were talking about it within us and we were trying to do our quotes in double quotes, a little research, uh, but no, in no way trying to get any bragging rights here, just a little Googling, that's what I mean. Um, it turned out that there's, there's a lot of awareness about it in general between the people who are associated with the community or have come across this. However, there's an entire segment of people who might not have even touched it. So then a natural curiosity occurred to me that for someone who's just around the corner giving all of us coffee, um, how does it matter to them? Like, uh, why should they even know about it? Why should they listen to us? Go ahead, all yours. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a great question. And really why I wrote the book, Editing Humanity, to both try to um, uh, share some stories um, and reveal some insights about the development and applications of CRISPR for people in the field who, who have followed this and work on it day in and day out, but also to appeal to quote unquote, the man on the street, the, uh, the person you know, who's making your coffee in the morning, um, who doesn't follow science, uh, but has maybe somehow heard about CRISPR or mm -hmm. seen a movie about it. Um, why should they care? I think CRISPR is uh, the most exciting revolution in genetics and genomics in many, many decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, the impact of this technique, which is being used around the world by researchers in every continent, um, is going to be felt, whether it's in treating genetic diseases, uh, of which there are literally thousands, or potentially uh, putting us on the path to a cure for cancer, or uh, helping us engineer new uh, crops that will uh, help uh, humankind uh, survive climate change and feed the planet as our population continues to explode. Um, or many other applications, including some fun ones that we may get to later on in our discussion, mm -hmm. including uh, resurrecting the woolly mammoth, which is, which is <laughs> a fun one. Um, so there are certainly elements where uh, science fiction is now morphing into potentially science fact. But I hope in the course of our discussion, we can separate what is going to remain science fiction from what is likely to become scientific reality. Mm -hmm. I think before going forward, maybe we can also dig deeper into maybe the history of CRISPR, like how did CRISPR came about? Yeah, yeah. Um, part one of Editing Humanity, my book, which came out at the end of 2020, um, deals with the heroes of CRISPR, the, the discovery of uh, and the development of this groundbreaking technology to edit uh, the sequence of DNA in any organism. Um, and you might think that that would be a sort of a natural thing that scientists would actually want to set out to, to achieve in a very kind of programmatic, systematic sense. But that's not how CRISPR uh, was discovered. It's one of these amazing uh, stories of serendipity in science where, where a handful of researchers in, in universities around the world were studying something almost completely different, uh, not trendy, not sexy, not cool, just because they were curious about a particular phenomenon that they had encountered. And, um, and one thing led to another. And now here we are uh, talking about uh, CRISPR, not as it was originally discovered, which is a form of bacterial immunity, but as a gene editing system that is changing the world in many different ways. So uh, very briefly, um, about 30, 40 years ago, scientists first stumbled on a weird uh, section of DNA when they were sequencing a, a bacterial genome. And this weird section had a, a series of repeating motifs. And this is the sort of 
phenomenon that in in a DNA sequence you wouldn't see, you wouldn't expect to see occur by you know by random chance. So chances are this had some sort of function. But the researchers who are in Japan um, weren't really they were interested more in the gene down down the road down the down the genome. So they passed on this. They noted it in their first paper. And only a handful of people took any notice. But one of the people who did take notice was a Spanish microbiologist mm -hmm. named Francisco Mojica. He was one of the first people that I decided to pay a visit to when I was researching the book. And I went out to his home in Alicante in Southeast Spain. And he took me uh, on a short drive down to the Salt Lakes uh, near, near his hometown. Uh, it looked like a nature reserve. It looked like I had stepped into a nature documentary, Planet <laughs> Earth or something like this. But this is a serious factory for mining salt from the Mediterranean. So mm -hmm. uh, there was a series of lagoons mm -hmm. and the salt is increasingly concentrated in a stepwise fashion. And uh, uh, the results were seen at the side of the road, an absolute mountain of salt that is used for both industrial and culinary purposes. So Mojica was interested in why certain microorganisms seem to thrive in this very salty, harsh, hostile environment. And he thought these funny CRISPR sequences, uh, he coined the term CRISPR in 2001, he thought that might be the secret, that this was somehow providing a biochemical uh, advantage to these bacteria. It was a lovely theory. It was totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he, he will freely admit, okay. but it got him obsessed almost with what 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 are these repeats? And more importantly, what are the weird sequences between the the DNA repeats? Mm -hmm. He couldn't find any connection between them or in any of the databases until one hot summer's day, he decided to take leave of the beach where he was vacationing, went back to the lab in the nice cool air conditioning, plugged in one of these uh, sequences, ran a computer search, and bingo, he got a hit, and it was to a virus that attacks bacteria. And as he reported a couple of years later, in a paper that was rejected by many journals before it was finally published, he noted that the, this so-called CRISPR repeat uh, domain in, back, in some bacteria is a home where the bacteria stitch into these repeats um, sequences of viral DNA that they have presumably encountered and defeated. So this is a bacterial immune system. And bacteria keep track of these viral sequences to distinguish friend from foe. So that if they could, should encounter this virus again, the bacteria have over millions of years evolved a system that we now kind of think of as this genetic scissors, mm -hmm. whereby the viral sequence that they stitched into their own DNA is now reactivated and sort of synthesized. Mm -hmm. It is attached to an enzyme that acts like a scissors that literally mm -hmm. cuts DNA. And the sequence that this RNA sequence that you've now attached to the, to the enzyme provides the homing beacon, the GPS signal that tells the scissors exactly where to go, where to attach and where to cut. You don't want a scissors just randomly cutting DNA or you know nothing would survive. So that was the, the basis of the of CRISPR. And for the first in the early 2000s, CRISPR was studied by a slowly growing band of scientists, but purely as a means to better understand how bacteria uh, survive in their sort of epic um, Game of Thrones like uh, uh, quest uh, or fight with with their viral uh, foes. Uh, and then over the course of several years, peaking in 2012, uh, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, the two women who won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry last year in 2020, right. um, solved a way to take this uh, natural system for mm -hmm. cutting DNA and turning it into a programmable system that mm -hmm. could now cut any DNA sequence in principle uh, of, of their or our choosing, and thus the CRISPR revolution uh, was born. So I think we already like deep dive into like some of, so to speak, inner workings of how might 
CRISPR, uh, editing in CRISPR works like. Maybe you can help us in visualizing by a real world example, or it can be, does not have to be necessarily real world, just so that even us or our audience can visualize how does, for example, this editing actually look like. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, to, let me just take a step back for a second uh, and say that um, wh why, why is editing so important? Why, why has it so uh, uh, stimulated, not just scientists, but the, but the public? Um, I trained as a geneticist in England many, many years, decades ago. Um, and the goal of, of the research I was involved in was to find genes that are mutated in terrible life-threatening genetic diseases like muscular dystrophy or cystic fibrosis. And we wanted to find these genes to A, better understand the, how these diseases um, uh, arise but just as importantly, figure out if we can now solve the molecular basis for how these disease, diseases arise, maybe now we can better figure out a way to actually treat and potentially cure these diseases. You're not going to be able to cure the disease if you don't know what is broken in the first place. Right. So that was that system. But we never, back in the 1980s and even the 1990s, I don't think anybody seriously thought that one day we could go into a cell scan the cell, scan the DNA in the nucleus of the cell for the one, sometimes it's one letter, one uh, sub, subunit of DNA, the, the, the alphabet of A, C, T, and G that everybody listening I'm sure is familiar with, um, figure out the one place where that has been mutated and is giving you this, this, uh, this faulty coding for this faulty uh, protein that's causing this disease and, and somehow go in and fix it like you had a molecular scalpel and make that change. And that's what CRISPR uh, has brought about, that, that turning that dream uh, that was so far-fetched, it was barely even a dream mm -hmm. and now uh, made it a reality. So CRISPR uh, is, was not the first gene editing system to be developed. It won the Nobel Prize, uh, as we just mentioned last year. But there were uh, a couple of other systems. Uh, one was called zinc finger nucleases, and there, were, uh, there was another one called talons. Um, but they were very hard, difficult to program, and the rights to these really only belonged to one specific biotech company. And early clinical trials using either of these systems um, uh, had shown some promising signs of success, but you could hardly claim they were, uh, you know, a, a runaway uh, uh, success. So when CRISPR came along uh, and was developed in 2012 and 2013, um, people seized on it, not so much because it was doing something that the other systems couldn't do, but because it was so easy to operate. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, a big part of why CRISPR has become this international phenomenon is that scientists around the world, almost any scientist, indeed almost any high school student who's got an interest in biology, could begin to get interested and start running CRISPR experiments. You don't need fancy million dollar uh, instruments uh, on the lab bench uh, mm -hmm. to run these things. Um, so that's a very important part of this, of this story. Um, to design a CRISPR experiment, if you want to change or edit a, a, a gene, um, you really just need to know the sequence uh, of the gene that you wish to, to edit. Uh, and then you can uh, design this uh, uh, RNA that you can then uh, tether or attach to uh, the enzyme that's called in the initial in, uh, um, specification of CRISPR, uh, the nuclease is called Cas9. So you often hear people refer to CRISPR-Cas9. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a wonderful uh, video that I show in my talks from a Japanese group. They published this work a few years ago, uh, showing a st uh, under a very high, very powerful kind of uh, atomic force. Microscopy is the name of the technique. But you see uh, this a blob which is the Cas9 enzyme that cuts the DNA, sort of hovering over a piece of DNA that it has been programmed to, uh, to identify and land on. And then at the appropriate moment after all the sort of the, all the, the sequence checks have been done, 
boom, you see the two ends of DNA literally just fall apart as the enzyme uh, cuts them. And when the Nobel Committee last year said, Chris, we're awarding the Nobel Prize for the discovery of quote unquote, the genetic scissors, um, it sounds like a kind of a crude analogy, but when you see this video, you think, yeah, holy cow, that really is like a, like a scissors. So what can you do? You can do a couple of things. One is you can cut the DNA. The DNA strands that you've just broken will, uh, will be repaired by the cell's own DNA repair machinery. But usually that will occur with one or two letters of DNA uh, missing. So if you're looking to, to inactivate a gene, Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very effective way of doing it. But you can also uh, find ways to now uh, correct the sequence. So maybe it is by providing um, an, an, uh, a template, the correct gene sequence that you can provide, and that can potentially be stitched into these uh, severed, uh, between these two severed strands. Um, or as we can discuss in more detail, um, new forms of gene editing since the discovery of CRISPR in 2012 and 2013 have uh, been published in the last few years mm -hmm. that are, give us even more um, precision uh, and now allow us to make literally pinpoint single base um, changes without even completely cutting the DNA. So this era of gene editing that has been um, uh, sparked by the discovery of CRISPR mm -hmm. is uh, continuing to evolve as more uh, new new enzymes are found that are part of the CRISPR family, and new um, new uh, chemistries are mm -hmm. developed uh, based on CRISPR that give us ever even greater finesse in making certain uh, DNA changes. Just a quick question uh, on on what you just said. So you said like, okay, even a high school student can do that. So for now, to me, at least someone who's def not coming from medical field. And coming from computer science, I, I hear two things. One still sounds very abstract. Second, I heard a word programming that they have created this tool, which is easy to program, right? What exactly does that mean? Well, like programming just means uh, essentially typing out the, uh, the complementary sequence to the sequence that you're trying to edit. Mm -hmm. So you literally provide the, 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 the GPS um, coordinates mm -hmm. in terms of A's, C's, T's, and G's. It's a uh -huh. short strand. And that is the guide RNA that will guide the, uh, the Cas enzyme to the spot in the genome that you wish to edit. Now, when Doughton and Charpentier published their groundbreaking paper in 2012, they were just studying DNA really in a test tube. Um, mm -hmm. And remember, CRISPR evolved as a, in a bacterial uh, mm -hmm. uh, context. Now, bacteria, obviously, they have a genome, they have DNA, but it is a fraction, maybe a millionth of the size of the human genome. And so mm -hmm. one important question that had to be resolved in the immediate uh, publication of CRISPR was, okay, all very well and good, CRISPR can edit DNA if it's just sort of floating loose in a test tube, but will CRISPR, will the CAS, can we deliver CRISPR into a cell into the nucleus of a cell, in particular, can we deliver it into the nucleus of a human cell, mm -hmm. which has a million times more DNA? Will the same principle, the same GPS signal, mm -hmm. still find its way uh, to the appropriate gene when you've got a million times more DNA? It's, you know, it's like a signal to noise question, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the answer, perhaps surprisingly, was yes, yes, it can. And that was proven by a couple of papers published in, Sci in, the, mag in the journal Science uh, in January 2013. Um, and indeed, there's still a big patent battle um, in the courts, uh, both in the US and Europe, about who, from a legal perspective, invented the commercial rights to CRISPR um, as the people who made, or some of the groups who've made that discovery in human cells um, were, were, feel that they have uh, priority over the work of Doudna and Charpentier. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, because of that signal to noise question, one of the big safety issues about CRISPR has been how sure can we be that when we do a CRISPR experiment, we're going to target the gene that we want to edit and not anything else. Right. And um, 
There's certainly been some concerns over that over the past few years, but scientists have been able to pretty much uh, improve the specificity to the extent that that is now um, a, a relatively small uh, consideration. Dialing in slightly a bit back, just so that I can summarize and understand and paint the picture in my head clearly. When you say that programmability here, and you explained it in a bit that we provide the RNA and it was about the test tube thing. So like you have one chemical in the test tube that was primarily uh, uh, some sort of bacteria sample, like a liquid. And then you have somehow by some chemical reaction created another RNA, and then you just entered that in the test tube. So now, so far so good, this doesn't seem harmful at any instance. And then the surprising thing which you mentioned was that could it work in humans? And the answer was yes. But now the question rather was how do you deliver it to the human cells in general? You cannot just give someone another glass of shot, which may or may not work. So yeah. we, would, we would come to that in general. But before that, uh, it would be rather more interesting, I guess, for the people, for well, anyone who's listening to this podcast rather, and even personally for me to know, since 2012, since that groundbreaking paper has been published, yeah, what has been achieved in reality on humans using CRISPR? Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, well, it, things have gotten really interesting just in the last two years. Um, and we can point to two or three uh, astonishing uh, reports um, and in two major publications in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, the most prestigious medical journal in the world, from two of the companies um, that were founded to, uh, to take the, 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 the potential of CRISPR and to, to, to turn, turn it into novel therapeutics. So um, in, uh, at the end of 2020, uh, a paper was published from scientists at CRISPR Therapeutics. Uh, that's a company that was founded by Emmanuel Charpentier, the Nobel laureate, um, uh, in which they've used CRISPR to treat patients with sickle cell disease. Now, sickle cell, of course, is a, just a horrific disease. It's a very common disease, particularly in people in Africa and across many parts of Asia and parts of the Mediterranean. Um, it's very common because if you carry one copy of the sickle cell gene, you actually are at an advantage against malaria. So in parts of the world where malaria kills uh, uh, children, um, you, you almost have like a, a little superpower if you inherit one copy of the sickle cell mutation. You don't have sickle cell disease per se, but you are resistant to malaria. So that's why the gene continues to spread across many parts of the world. Uh, sorry to break your flow, but just so for the uninitiated, uh, uh, just a brief primer. What a sickle cell essentially, if I understand correctly, is that our red blood cells are circular in shape and their primary yes. function is to carry oxygen. But yes. in some people, they are unfortunate enough through no fault of their own, their cells become not circular, but rather the shape of a sickle, something that Correct. you use to cut grasses, like half moon or crescent shape. Yes. And then they cannot carry oxygen and that's a really big problem. Right. I could not. I could not have said that better myself. Very, mm -hmm. very well put. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if you inherit two copies of the the sickle cell mutation, which is a mutation in the beta globin gene, uh, it it messes up the the uh, the, the structure uh, of uh, your hemoglobin, the pr the protein that carries oxygen around the body, uh, and this deforms the red blood cells. They they kind of block. They they can't travel through the body as, as smoothly, as easily as, as normal red blood cells. They choke uh, capillaries and veins, and this leads to terrible uh, uh, bouts of pain, pain crises, and uh, many forms of organ failure. So, uh, and we've known about the molecular basis of this for decades, since the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And yet we really don't have a cure for this. So sickle cells become a very uh, important uh, model system for CRISPR. Uh, there are many different projects, but the one that we wanted to focus on, which was published just about a, a little uh, under a year ago, uh, basically reported that in a handful of patients in the first clinical trial uh, being managed by, by CRISPR therapeutics, um, the results have been spectacular. And so what they have done in these patients, this is not an easy uh, process, uh, let, let's be very clear, but essentially they're, they're building on an observation that was made some time ago that 
um, uh, another form of uh, globin called fetal globin can compensate for the beta globin that carries the mutation in sickle cell disease. And so if we could just figure out a way to switch back on the gene that encodes for fetal globin, which is normally shut down shortly after birth, um, we could potentially uh, give the, the blood cells in, in the, a sickle cell patient a new lease of life uh, because they would just simply be using the fetal globin mm. uh, instead of the beta globin, which isn't working properly. Right. So that's what the CRISPR in this scenario is designed to do. I won't go through the pathway involved, but essentially by it's, it's sort of, uh, they're, they're playing with some of the regulatory steps that, that control the expression of this uh, fetal globin um, gene. And um, so they take the uh, bone marrow cells out of the uh, patient. They then, the patient uh, undergoes chemotherapy to, um, uh, to uh, sort of evacuate the bone marrow. So there's now a place when the edited cells are transplanted back, they can, they can repopulate. Mm -hmm. um, outside in the lab, the cells that you've taken from the patient are edited using CRISPR-Cas9. They are then re-infused, uh, re re-transplanted back into the patient. And if they seed and repopulate, um, then the newly edited cells expressing fetal globin now, uh, whereas normally they wouldn't express this fetal globin gene, uh, can, can um, give rise to healthy red blood cells. And the results from the first few patients including one who has been interviewed many and profiled many times on national public radio in America, a woman from um, the south of the United States named Victoria Gray. Uh, this is a, a miraculous story. She's essentially been cured of sickle cell. She's reported no further pain crises since her procedure now over two years ago, no blood transfusions required. Um, so this is, uh, really an absolutely miraculous story. Um, but this is not a technique that is going to scale easily. So um, there are still many years of hard work ahead. This uh, process will have to be replicated and validated and expanded into many more patients, both in the US and in Europe and other parts of the world before the company can <clears throat> try to seek approval for this gene editing wonder drug Mm -hmm. um, and when they do seek approval, then we get to the very awkward and difficult question of how are they going to price it? Because after spending hundreds of millions of dollars investing in the company uh, to develop this system and to, to manage the clinical trials, that company is going to need to see some return on its very hefty investment. Right. And so we run into this sort of conflict now where you want to price the drug low so that patients with sickle cell disease around the world can take advantage of this potential amazing mm -hmm. cure. But at the same time, the company needs to uh, receive revenue uh, for its therapy so they can now invest in the next wave of gene editing drug. So mm -hmm. those are discussions that we're gonna be seeing on the front pages of the newspapers in the yeah. years ahead. I think we definitely uh, want to touch upon the commercial side of things and what's happening there, including like, this conundrum we might face in future of drug uh, price policy. Uh, I was wondering something which you mentioned before, like, so it's very interesting to see already some on ground result where CRISPR is highly effective. Like you gave example of this woman from US who is already doing quite well. I was wondering, uh, since most of us, including myself, who got to know about CRISPR were roughly in 2018, right? Where this famous incident from China ha happened where this, I think, a biophysicist named uh, He Janku, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, did some editing on uh, embryos. I think Lula and, uh, Lulu, and Lulu and Nana were their names, right? And this was like a big story. And when we were reaching out to you, we also realized that you were sitting in the front row when he was publishing his results, right? So we have already saw that how a technology like CRISPR, which can potentially be life-saving, um, can also be misused. So, right. so I was wondering what are your thoughts on like the ethical dilemmas related to CRISPR yeah. and how much problem it will create yeah. for scientific community or people like you who are pushing a lot on the positive aspects of yes. CRISPR to become reality. 
Yes, great question. I'm glad we've spent the first part of our interview talking about the um, the approved and exciting medical applications of CRISPR so that we can contrast what those researchers and some of these companies uh, like CRISPR Therapeutics and Intellia and Editas and Beam Therapeutics and many others, mm -hmm. we can contrast that with what the, um, the researcher that you mentioned, I'm gonna pronounce it slightly differently, He Jiang Kui, mm -hmm. um, and I'm just gonna call him JK for short, mm -hmm. um, uh, what he's trying to do. Uh, let's make a very crucial uh, distinction. Um, when we talk and indeed celebrate the early success that companies like CRISPR and Intellia and Editas are having in devising gene editing treatments for sickle cell disease or a hereditary form of blindness or a rare liver disease, um, uh, in all of those cases and in many others that are under development, uh, this is a form of what we call somatic gene therapy. We are simply delivering genes or the CRISPR gene editing machinery to uh, cells in an organ, uh, in, a, in an adult, possibly one day in, in children. Um, but where th this is in the fully grown human being or a fully developed human being, uh, where we're just attacking uh, the cells that make up the blood system or the liver or the photoreceptors behind the eye, behind the retina. Um, uh, and when we add or try to play with the DNA in, in any of these tissues or organs, we're only affecting the DNA sequence in those specific cells. These are not edits that will become populated throughout the body. And these are not edits that could potentially be passed on to um, our children. Okay, so that's a hugely important distinction. What He Jiang Kui or JK attempted to do uh, was uh, really disgraceful uh, because he took it upon himself to cross a major ethical red line where he felt it was okay to edit the genes of a human embryo. Now, why is that such a big deal? Mm -hmm. Because if that embryo is then implanted into a woman and she, she becomes pregnant and the, the, the child is born, um, then if the edit has been successful, those edited, that edited gene or sequence will have become, will have doubled with every cell doubling mm. uh, as the embryo developed into a fully formed fetus and then into a, into a child, into a newborn, such that those edited cells will be present in every cell in the, in the newborn baby, including the egg or sperm cells. So that edit is now something that can be passed on to future generations. Um, and nobody uh, in their right mind thought that the medical establishment or the scientific research community were ready to embark on that sort of um, experiment. Uh, but JK took it upon himself and in great secrecy in 2018, recruited couples uh, where uh, the, the father uh, was HIV positive and the couple wanted to have a child uh, who they could guarantee would, be, would not inherit, would not uh, receive or be HIV positive when born. Mm -hmm. Ironically, there are medical steps that can be done, um, including a step called sperm washing, mm -hmm. that would essentially guarantee that there would be no risk of transmitting HIV Mm -hmm. um, and JK in his experiments did that step, but still went one massive uh, step further. And that was to edit the DNA of these embryos to inactivate uh, the gene that, that codes for the receptor that provides the pathway for HIV to enter mm -hmm. cells. And we know that this is a, a, a biological a valid biological uh, rationale because there are many people around the world who naturally carry a mutation in this gene, which is called CCR5, mm -hmm. who are resistant to HIV infection. Mm. So that was the sort of the idea that, that uh, uh, JK um, decided to pursue. Uh, many, my own reporting and the reporting of others who've written about this suggests that um, 
uh, it, well, it's so many things of interest to say about JK. Uh, he was a successful scientist. He was very young, very ambitious. Mm. He was already uh, running a, a successful In DNA 30s, sequencing right? company. So it wasn't like, you know, he needed, to, he, he, he was, uh, you know, becoming quite famous in his own right. Mm -hmm. um, but he somehow latched on to gene editing as a way to become even more famous um, and seeking not just personal fame, but also respect for, I think, um, his university and his country. He was bothered by the fact that many early human embryo gene editing experiments with no intention of implanting embryos into uh, women and just to into mothers just to just to understand whether gene editing is feasible. Many of these were from other Chinese research teams, but they were published in very minor journals. When an American team decided to do this, uh, it was published in Nature. He seemed particularly bothered by that, like somehow uh, the, the medical uh, scientific publishing establishment wasn't taking Chinese scientists um, seriously. And he also visited a few years ago um, one of the villages in rural China that had been laid waste by HIV. There's a, still a major HIV epidemic and major uh, stigmatization of HIV uh, patients in China. And I think it appears that he was very um, personally affected. He grew up in this sort of a community and personally, personally affected by this. So in 2018, uh, the, the, the two twins, Lulu and Nana, were born in secret. Uh, we don't know where they were born. That, has, that is the information that has not been revealed. And we know nothing about the health of those twins. Um, we, we hope here in, I'm speaking to you from Washington, DC, you're in Germany. We hope, uh, experts in the West hope that the twins are well and are, are being monitored. Uh, but we have, we've had no reassurance uh, uh, to, that, to that fact. Um, the, we know about the edits that were performed. The, the edits were very messy. Mm -hmm. They did not, JK did not succeed in replicating or mimicking the precise deletion that we know exists in nature. So Lulu and Nana are walking human experiments. Their DNA has been butchered and cut in ways that has never been seen before in, in other human beings and has never been modeled in mice or, um, or any other animal system. And that should not have been allowed. That, should, that just simply should not have been allowed to progress. So uh, briefly, where are we now? JK is in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, he's serving a three year prison sentence. Um, and the community has uh, studied the, uh, and debated the impact of his experiments now in many different forms and in some major uh, reports that have been published. And the main conclusion seems to be that uh, editing of human embryos is not something that should be completely banned forever, that there may be situations in the years or decades ahead where it makes sense for this to be attempted if it can be done safely that's a very, very big if. Mm -hmm. And if there is no other medical uh, technique that will allow a couple uh, to have a biologically healthy child. There are many techniques out there today that do allow for a selection to, for families who have a, a family history of a genetic disease right. to have a biologically healthy child. And one is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and that will work in many many situations but if you imagine a two uh, patients with sickle cell disease who live into their early adulthood who, who get married and want to have a child and want to have a child who does not have sickle cell disease then no form of embryo selection is going to help them have a, a healthy child they would have to resort to gene editing to change um, the, the sequence of one of those, at least one of those uh, sickle cell genes, preferably both. Um, so that is the sort of scenario where, um, according to the experts, um, maybe down the road, genome editing could see some sort of authorized, um, supervised uh, application. Um, so that's what the, that's the official picture. Mm -hmm. Whether uh, there is somebody out there uh, a, an entrepreneur or somebody, uh, somebody bent on fame and fortune who thinks they can um, emulate JK just because he's in jail in China doesn't mean that 
um, uh, some other administration may not just sort of look the other way and allow somebody to set up a clinic where this uh, sort of experiment could be attempted. I very much hope that will not happen, but I couldn't rule it out. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm curious, like you mentioned some very interesting thing and maybe it's a bit of a controversial question. So I'm not uh, personally, I totally agree with what you said with my limited understanding of, of, uh, of the whole story. Um, but I was curious, like, did somehow he pushed forward the field ahead just because of getting all the attention by doing this on humans? Because I'm not sure how much it was done before humans, apparently not so much, especially on embryos. There, there were, he, he, in, in a, in a, he did not push the f- he put he did not push the the field ahead in any way mm-hmm. um uh from a technological standpoint um he was just naively almost applying uh crispr in its original form into these human embryos following recipes i suspect that had his, been published. his intention sorry to interrupt but his intention still seems to be valid to me right like he's so okay i'm not talking about the the geopolitical situation of it all, like how he feels about Western scientists or, or nature, what you mentioned before, how he felt about publications in nature from American scientists versus Chinese. And barring all those, I mean, surely as a neutral party, I think his intention was, okay, this couple has HIV, there is this new technology, why not use it to uh, help because, save these children? Right, because uh, two reasons, one, um, there, as, I, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, there, there is already a technique that mm-hmm. would, from a medical perspective, guarantee the couple that their child would not have HIV. Right. And he performed that technique during the course as a, as a, as a preamble to doing the gene editing. So... Um, when we were at Hong, in Hong Kong in, in November 2018, when he presented these results in public for the first time, uh, he took some questions from the audience. And the first was from one of the leading experts in gene editing, David Liu at, at Harvard University. And David's question was spot on. David asked him, what was the unmet medical need that you were trying to solve? And he could not answer that question because JK seemed he'd already jumped forward in his mind about 10 steps to a time when almost the whole of China would be, uh, HIV would become eradicated because somehow um, the this sort of gene editing process was being widely applied on the gene editing population. So it was a shockingly um, uh, 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 mm-hmm. poor, uh, shameful uh, piece of work. And we know this because uh, he, uh, many months afterwards, um, the manuscript that he had written up and was hoping to be published and hoping to see his name in lights on the cover of Nature, um, the journal Nature, um, that manuscript was leaked to a reporter who put many, many excerpts of it online. And the logic, the thinking behind the paper, the rationale was, um, was just childish. It wasn't, it wasn't thought through. It was about trying to save yeah. you know, thousands of lives mm. when there was no need for gene editing to be used in this way. And he did not address the ethical uh, issues as that mm-hmm. we've just touched on, which is that for every child who would be edited in this way, those edits would now be passed on. And so unless you're 100% certain that Mm -hmm. you've performed that editing experiment in a completely safe fashion, Mm -hmm. you have no right to be um, carving up somebody's DNA and then kind of crossing your fingers and hoping for the best that they don't develop cancer or their children don't develop cancer Mm -hmm. or something like that. You convincingly put forward this point uh, on, on the fact that, okay, ethically, there's no questions that there is a black and white in this case, in which I think to a certain extent, I agree. I may be factually quite incorrect, but this is very analogically similar. It sounds very analogically similar to how atomic bomb came into picture in one sense or the other. So I don't know where I read it, but um, I forgot the author, but it pretty much the sum, to sum up what all happened in the story was that history doesn't always repeat itself, but it does like to rhyme. <laughs> 
Yes, nice. <laughs> but yeah. uh, I'd rather have a technical follow-up, slightly smaller technical follow-up on that. Now that we know that some people are always going to do this nefarious activities, maybe not just on embryo cells, but to let's say um, edit some human out or do something else. Once we know that, okay, this is the person we have targeted whose embryo was, now he's a grown adult and his or her embryo was targeted and they butchered or something like that. Is there a way just by looking at their DNA, could we find a signature which would indicate that there was some sort of butchering that happened at the point? Um, okay, I think we, we, we should be careful about using terms like mm -hmm. uh, butchering, mm -hmm. but um, if in principle, it, CRISPR and other forms of gene editing can be used to make uh, DNA edits that are as small as changing one letter out of a three billion letter genetic code in human beings. And if I was to present to you the genome sequence of person A, uh, who is carrying the genome that they were born with, and person B, who had a, a, an edited, uh, this edit made, um, you would not be able to say, there's, there's no sort of, it's not like there's a, a barcode or, or a QR code that's sort of left in the genome uh, that tells you, aha, this one was edited, this, uh, but the other one wasn't. Um, and that's the point for some of the applications of gene editing, but in particular, uh, when we talk about agriculture, we want the edit to be as seamless and as innocuous as possible, because one of the big scares about uh, genetically modified food over the last several decades has been you're, you're, you're interfering with nature, you're leaving this strange gene or sequence in the plant genome that doesn't belong there. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of CRISPR is that it completely blows up that experiment by potentially saying, yeah, we're not gonna leave anything there. We're simply going in with our scalpel. It's not even a scissors anymore, it's a scalpel. And we're gonna tease out the, 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 the base that is giving us the undesirable property uh, or is making my plant uh, uh, susceptible to some sort of pest or parasite and in, in, uh, and now making it uh, more resistant. Um, so I hope that answers your, your mm -hmm. question. In the case of Lulu and Nana, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, because um, uh, th they were uh, butchered isn't quite, is too strong a word, but they mm -hmm. were certainly the, the, the DNA, the, the, the gene in question, the CCR5 gene, was altered in ways that has not been reported in any other human being on the planet, to my knowledge. So if mm. you were to sequence Lulu and Nana today, you would see that there was something weird with that particular gene that you might suspect had been the result of, of some sort of gene editing. It would be a very weird, you would not have seen that variant otherwise. Yeah, I think that leads to like sort of my next question because we already touched upon like this, use of scissor quite a bit or now there are already let's say upgrades of of cas9 i think one of them is called cas9 nick case if i'm not wrong where you can do targeting very very precisely right but uh, even with all this there are still scares of off targeting like side effects of it so i was curious uh, where do we stand there even with this precision how much there are chances of something going wrong in simple english I think there's 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 a very small uh, there, there, right. So the uh, we talked earlier about the the challenge of CRISPR in a in the context of a, a complex genome like a human or a plant genome, mm -hmm. uh, but let's stick with humans for, for for now. Of finding the right gene sequence that you wish to edit, um, but because the sequence that you're targeting is quite small, maybe just a little over twenty bases, 20 A's, C's, T's, and G's, there is some finite mathematical possibility that a very, very similar or possibly even identical sequence might just exist by chance in some other far-flung part of the genome. So you're trying to target a gene on chromosome 14, and maybe somewhere on chromosome 3, there is a, a, a sequence that matches you know, 95%. Mm -hmm. So your CRISPR uh, machinery could could potentially 
accidentally find its way because of its GPS signal mm -hmm. to this uh, other sequence and then make the edit in a place that you you had no intention of, of, of being edited. So this has been a, a known issue almost since the, 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 the beginning of CRISPR gene editing. And scientists have uh, made great progress in, in minimizing the chances of that happening. We now have full sequences of the human genome. So a priori, you can calculate and almost predict where the, the chances of off-target events uh, happening might be. Uh, and then you can design the, uh, the, 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 the sequences and, and some of the other parameters that go in to maximize the chances of only targeting the sequence that you wish to edit. There's also ways of, of kind of shutting off CRISPR now after you've administered it so that it isn't simply sort of floating around the nucleus uh, in an active state, potentially to cause damage. You kind of, you can, you can tap it down. So, um, what do you mean by uh, and the, the down. fact that sorry, the just, fact that sorry, well, just, so that you can either, either inactivate it or, uh -huh. or somehow sort of flush it out. Uh -huh. um, okay. So that you and the progress that we've seen um, in, in reported, uh, we talked about sickle cell disease. Uh, another major study was published a few months ago, also in the New England Journal from another company in human clinical trial volunteers suffering from a rare liver disease in which CRISPR now was, at, was injected directly into the body of the, of the volunteer. The, the CRISPR was delivered into the appropriate cells in the liver. Uh, the editing was performed and it prevents the toxic buildup of a protein in this particular, uh, particular disease. Um, the fact that we've got to this point and we're now injecting CRISPR in live you know, human patients is a testament to the years of preparatory work that have gone in and stud not just studying CRISPR in, in, in on the computer and in, in, in liquid DNA form in, in, in test tubes, but in animal models to get to this point. So mm -hmm. many, I wouldn't, I'm not refuse to say that every safety question about CRISPR has been uh, completely addressed. But the fact that we are where we are shows the, the amazing progress uh, that has been made. But we have to understand something. In medicine, um, with any new drug, with any new gene therapy, there are, uh, there's a small amount of risk. And CRISPR is, doesn't get um, a, a pass or sort of an exclusion from how medicine works. With any new surgery procedure, um, there might be experimental procedure, there might be some risk. Um, and even today in 2021, 22 years after the death of a patient in a, a gene therapy experiment um, uh, named Jesse Gelsinger, there are still, despite all the progress that has been made in developing new uh, forms of viruses to deliver genes into cells for therapeutic purposes, there are still adverse events being reported. So the, 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 science, the scientists and the companies that are working on this state-of-the-art genetic medicine are still learning, are still at the bench, are still researching ways to make it ever safer. And, and part of that equation is finding the right, uh, you know, Trojan horse to deliver the cargo mm -hmm. into the cell, whether that be a virus or a sort of a a fatty, uh, a vesicle made of, of sort of fatty material that can, can kind of uh, bleed into the cell um, or some other system. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that work is continuing. It's not, it's not a closed case just yet. So, so uh, maybe in short, you can tell us where does it look like legally speaking, like how much uh, CRISPR has made progress and in short term future, what can we expect? Can we see a drug, for example, two, three years from now in market for sickle cell anemia or some other diseases like that? Well, I think, I think um, yeah, two, three years may be uh, ambitious just because clinical trials take lots of money and mm -hmm. lots of time to perform. The results obviously have to be analyzed. They have to be written up and evaluated and published and presented. And then you have, when the company or the sponsor thinks the time is right, then obviously you go to, to the FDA and that process can take uh, a long time. And I think with something as experimental and as new 
uh, as CRISPR, uh, the FDA is going to want to take a very long look at this. So I hesitate to put a timeline. I don't think it'll be two or three years, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe five. Let's, so okay. I did put a timeline on. Okay, let's say five. <laughs> um, but then we have um, the challenge, as we touched on earlier, how is this going to be priced? And uh, however it's going to be priced, it's going to be high. I think that's pretty mm -hmm. clear. The first gene therapies that have been approved in the last few years um, come with one to two million dollar price tags and Oof. the companies or, and the developers of these therapies say, yes, that's a lot of money. We appreciate mm -hmm. that. But for a one time injection that can provide a life saving cure that potentially uh, prevents the patient or saves the patient from having to spend a lifetime going to hospital for mm. transfusions or other types of therapy. Um, you can see how the price can start to balance out compared to the alternative. Mm -hmm. And they're one and done. That's that's sort of the holy grail. So basically um, CRISPR, basically CRISPR and space technology are both for top 1%. <laughs> well, at the moment, I, th I think, travel, yes, sorry. I, I, don't, I don't want to joke about it. I mean, yes, space travel, definitely. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, it, CRISPR initially, I think it, it's, it, that is going to be the challenge as with gene therapy and with other state-of-the-art um, therapies, CAR-T therapy yeah. um, and other designer drugs. Mm -hmm. um, these things are priced beyond the reach of many people. But I guess um, this is how the course of science anyways works. Yes. Ev yeah. Everything that yes. starts first is difficult and then suddenly we find out yeah. quicker and better. Yeah. About so for patients with who are listening, uh, who perhaps have family members or friends who have sickle cell disease, we're, we're obviously focusing on CRISPR because that's the subject of my book and the subject of this conversation. But there are uh, there is progress being made in other areas. And so there's a company in California called Global Blood Therapeutics. I recently interviewed the CEO for one of our own uh, podcasts, a show uh, that you can find on YouTube called Close to the Edge. Um, his name is Ted Love. And uh, he's developing, his company's developing uh, just a, a, a regular drug, a small molecule chemical that can latch on to hemoglobin, which we talked about earlier, and make some conformational shifts that can restore some properties to carry oxygen. Um, and you know, I hope that is a huge success, even if that, that may hurt CRISPR in the long run, because mm -hmm. wouldn't you, obviously the, 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 the idea, the ideal would be uh, a pill that you can give. I don't know if that'd be once a week or once a day or once a month or whatever, mm -hmm. but that is obviously the, the, the ideal for treating patients with sickle cell across Africa and many parts of Asia um, where, because the alternative with CRISPR is going to be much more uh, complicated. Hopefully so. Now that we're going, venturing into this direction of um, corporate world and the interaction of gene editing or CRISPR in some sense, for example, CRISPR therapeutics is one of the companies, I guess, which is founded yeah. by the creator who won the Nobel yeah. Prize, Professor Charpentier, if I'm pronouncing yes. correctly. Yes. And then there is Syntego as well, where you also happen to have given another interview, if I'm right in my search. Yeah. In, in, in artificial intelligence, which is the talk of the town more often than not, uh, I being a part of the community, we know that the poster child these days is the self-driving or the autonomous vehicles. And that is primarily because it's an industry-driven funding and they want to uh, make products out of this technology. And this is why research primarily and the research papers that come out are significantly more in that direction. And every time the economics of the funding in a particular research field is dominated by these major companies who can fund money into it. What is the poster child of gene editing as of today? And where is it heading? Well, I think the poster child today is, um, in my opinion, is Victoria Gray, who, mm -hmm. Um, your, your listeners can uh, do a Google search on her name, G-R-A-Y, and we'll find many interviews with her. And it's an amazing, inspiring story. She's, I don't believe she's a wealthy person. She's a mother of three from Mississippi in the South, in one of the Southern states in America. But uh, her doctor, or she heard about this trial, she volunteered very bravely. She spent two months in hospital um, prepping for and then receiving uh, this, this groundbreaking treatment. And um, 
will be an inspiration, I hope, for patients with sickle cell and other diseases for decades to come. I, I mean, I hope eventually there's a stamp with her face on it and a, a <laughs> coin and, and every other um, celebration that I think she deserves for, for, for taking on this, this challenge. So that to me is the is sort of the real um, the real the real highlight. Um, I'm not a plant geneticist, but uh, there's a chapter in Editing Humanity about the use of CRISPR in plants, and um, that becomes a political discussion where mm -hmm. there are parts of the world, particularly in Africa and even in Europe, where there's great hostility to the notion that we can play and tamper with, um, uh, you know, with with nature with a small mm -hmm. n. Uh, and plants, but uh, if we just let, you know, and there's a big, as we're interviewing, as we're taping this interview, there's a big, of course, the big climate change conference uh, underway in Scotland. But if we don't start doing something and applying our technological ingenuity to solving some of these problems, we're, we're going to really be facing a very bleak future. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, CRISPR is the technology that human ingenuity has brought us and we should apply it to helping plants um, stave off disease and stave off the effects of climate change, drought, um, mm -hmm. and so on. I think um, uh, just just to, because I think what Dev was referring to as poster child of technology, I think you are totally right of Victoria being sort of the face yeah. of the CRISPR yeah. operation. What we were referring to was more like, where do you see the commercial aspect of CRISPR going? Are there like a specific type of therapeutics for uh, like cancer or something, which is where most of the funding is going or yeah. where sort of like we are heading yeah. in CRISPR? Actually sickle cell disease, um, interestingly, is seems to be the most studied mm -hmm. uh, disease for gene editing at the moment okay. because there are many different uh, approaches. I, we talked about Victoria Gray as being one approach where we're boosting fetal globin, but there are other ways to address mm -hmm. the same problem, mm -hmm. including, well, why not just reverse the, uh, the mutation that causes sickle cell disease? And that, in a way, is the, the ultimate I idea, the holy grail. Mm -hmm. um, with the chemistry that we currently have, there's a method, a technique called base editing, developed by David Liu and commercially available through a company outside Boston called uh, Beam Therapeutics. Beam stands for base editing and more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can make single base changes. Now the chemistry doesn't currently allow them to make, to just reverse the sickle cell change back to the common uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, letter at that particular position of the gene. But what the chemistry does allow us to do is to make a different change at that same spot, that same location. And we know that while this change isn't the, 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 the version of the gene that I carry or you carry, uh, it's a perfectly harmless, benign variant because it's been seen and, and cataloged in, in people in nature. So that seems like a really perfectly plausible um, scenario. So sickle cell is the main uh, focus. Um, there are literally six or 7,000 genetic diseases caused by mutations that we know. And in maybe not today, but in the course of the next few years, we will be able to, you know, on a PowerPoint slide, show how gene editing in principle could bring about a fix for all of these or the vast majority of these different diseases. Um, the question is who's gonna develop them? I mean, without some commercial yeah. payback or investment, that's going to be very hard. Many of these diseases are very, very rare, uh, but that's, uh, that's where this is going. And there are applications in cancer as well, but uh, cancer is a difficult, there's many, many different diseases. And I think the, the research there is still in a fairly early stage. So I think we'll save that for another podcast. Yeah. Well, I actually, it seems like a good also point to notice that we already took a lot of your time, more than we initially promised. And we touched upon like various aspects of CRISPR. So first of all, thanks a lot for taking time to not just educate our audience, but also to both of us uh, on various aspects of CRISPR. Goes without saying, we will link uh, not just your recent book uh, on CRISPR, but your other uh, four books as well in our show notes. Uh, Kevin just showed it uh, in, in our screen. Maybe we'll show the video and then you can see, see him yeah. holding and, and smiling. Um, 
yeah so uh, before we end the podcast besides like i think li- just listening to this podcast i hope the way i am at least feeling very excited to check more what is happening in the field of crispr uh, besides your book do you have any other suggestions for our audience before we leave which they yeah. can check out to, yeah, to educate sure. themselves mo- not just on crispr per se but gene editing in general yeah well uh so so uh my book editing humanity began as really a story about um how crispr was developed mm-hmm. and i started writing this in 2017 2018 and shortly after i started writing it a book was published by no less than jennifer doudner who went on to win the nobel prize mm-hmm. um part autobiography part memoir part textbook on on crispr biology she co-wrote this book with one of her former colleagues sam sternberg and it's an excellent book so as i was just starting mine you know initially i thought oh no the, i've been scooped already <laughs> i kept going um and uh, and then uh, events really changed in 2018 when we heard about uh, her jankwee and i took mm-hmm. in the in the beginning of the book about landing flying to hong kong for a conference a bioethics conference oh. and um I had a little money left in my travel budget. I'd saved it <laughs> so I was able to justify going to this uh, conference and um, pre-covid so they weren't streaming it uh, or if they were streaming it it wasn't at a you know that's the time difference was was poor for the United States. So I landed turned on uh, my phone and Twitter had blown up on my timeline mm. because uh, a journalist at uh, MIT Technology Review named Antonio Regalado had got the scoop of a lifetime almost where he had uh presented evidence that JK Herjankwee was altering the DNA of human embryos he didn't know that babies had been born but that revelation uh was uh, uh, declared just a few hours later uh with another story posted um from the associated press and then JK himself posted a bunch of videos on YouTube um mm-hmm. that obviously he had recorded planning for the big uh, announcement that he thought would uh, shower him with accolades uh, around the world. So editing humanity is a story not just about crispr but about gene editing. I spent uh, part 2 is about gene therapy, the history of gene therapy and how gene editing plays into that. Part 3 is about the bioethics and the ramifications of uh, the JK scandal. And then part 4 is about other applications. We didn't talk about the resurrection of woolly mammoths and more about plants mm-hmm. uh, and more about the future of the technology. There are many other there's been half a dozen fantastic books uh, about CRISPR and gene editing published in the last year or two. Um the best-selling author Walter Isaacson has a biography of Jennifer Doudna uh called The Codebreaker. That's by far the best-selling book in this field. So you can read that after you've read my book. Um <laughs> Hank Greeley has a very good book uh, called CRISPR People. Yeah. John Evans, a sociologist at UCSD, has the human gene editing debate. Uh and Evan Kirksey has a book called The Mutant Project. So um so many other uh, really good books um mm-hmm. uh, that provide a, a a a look at gene editing not just about the science and the applications but about the ethics and um the philosophical ramifications of this uh, amazing technology. We're going to link all the books that you mentioned in the show notes for sure Great. with one book slightly being in bold letters which may or may not be from our guest <laughs> i appreciate uh, that thank you but um, and also for people who are not into books for some reason which i fail to understand uh, <laughs> there's a good documentary called human nature on yes, netflix yes. Uh, which is very very nicely made and also covers up some of the aspects that we covered so netflix and chill guys i just also realized <laughs> that what kevin told us he also has a audio book Mm-hmm. which yeah, he narrated yeah, yeah, yeah. himself so, yeah, so we, if we can also come to do that there. do do go for the yeah, i had the pleasure of narrating the audio book yeah. um uh for editing humanity which is a lot harder than it sounds <laughs> so um, i guess i guess if you like the voice of kevin in this podcast indeed, right so then yeah. definitely yeah. Right. you can listen right. more hours of his voice on this that's right. amazing book well with that kevin we would like to thank you once again thanks a lot for taking your time on your monday morning in washington dc Thank you so much for having me. I love the conversation and good luck to you on on in your in your work and studies so and uh, and to the podcast. It's great. Thank yeah. you.